Welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by loserpool.com. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simu, and on this North London Derby special, I am thrilled to announce that I'll be joined by two fantastic guests. The first of which is the guy that I credit for inspiring me to take up podcasting myself. It's Mr. Ars Blog himself, Andrew Mang, and he'll be joining me alongside former Arsenal striker Jeremy Aliadier. What a show. Uh, I'm getting nervous thinking about it. I haven't even recorded it yet. Looking forward to this one. I've got plenty of listener questions from you guys, so thank you so much to all of those who have sent those in. We'll be working our way through them uh, towards the end of the show. But first, we're going to hear from these two fantastic guests uh, and get their thoughts on a controversial North London derby. Joining me on this week's show is a man that's known as Podcasting Royalty. It's Andrew from Ask Blog. Andrew, welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna. It's been about a year, I think. Oh, thanks been? very much. You're more good. than welcome. Yeah, good. 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 Yeah, thanks for having me again. Glad to hear you're doing well. And joining me is a former Arsenal striker, one that I used to cheer on in the Highbury days. Jeremy Aliadier, welcome to the Chronicles of Aguna for the first time. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you for having me. You're more than welcome, Jeremy. And uh, I did announce a little while ago that you were going to be on the show and I had to cancel. Normally it's the superstar cancelling, but this time it was me. Uh, My son was born a couple of days before, so I had to cancel that one. Uh, But we finally (laughs) got Jeremy here uh, so we can talk all things North London Derby. Uh, Jeremy, I'm going to start with yourself. Now, let's take it right back to the beginning of the game because uh, I don't know about you, but when I saw the starting lineup, I must admit... I was thinking, Unai's taking a real risk here. What was your initial thoughts on on that starting eleven? Uh, to be honest with you, I was like you. You know, I was very surprised of uh, of all the changes that he made, and I was a bit worried. But at the end, you kind of think that he, you know, some of the boys that that, that were that I didn't think were going to play played quite well so I was uh, I was surprised at the beginning but at the end you kind of think that he, he obviously made the made the right decision absolutely uh, Andrew what were your initial thoughts when when the lineup was announced I I don't think I was as surprised as you guys I I, I sort of expected him to play a back three but had an inkling he might go with a back four to put the extra man in midfield. Uh, and he did that with Aaron Ramsey, obviously coming in ahead of Mesut Ozil. Um, I think the only strange thing for me really was the, was the selection of Mustafi at right back. And I don't think that was because he thought Mustafi was going to be great at right back. I just think there isn't really anything else for him there at the moment with Hector out injured, Licksteiner's injured, Ainsley Maitland-Niles a bit, uh, you know, hasn't always done as well as we might like at right back. So I think for a big game, he just went with an experienced player. And it was always going to be one of Aubameyang or Lacazette. And seeing as Aubameyang started in the previous game, I, I can see why he picked why he picked uh, Lacazette. So it wasn't that surprising to me. Um, I, I could see people um, having lots of opinions on it online before the game, all right. But I think at the end, he was more or less justified in, in the selection that he made. Yeah, absolutely. I think the selection was justified. You're absolutely right in saying that. Um, I think for me, it was kind of, I think what you said is spot on, Andrew. I think when you think about it logically, you probably would have thought that that lineup made sense. But at the time, at the heat of the moment, just before kickoff, you're looking at it and, you know, Rio Ferdinand on TV, winding up the situation as well, saying that all our best players on the bench and you're thinking to yourself, hold on a minute, is this actually the case? I mean, Jeremy, uh, Lacazette started up front and you're a former striker yourself and, and, you know, Alex Lacazette didn't have his greatest game, in my opinion. I was a little bit disappointed with him in the first half because I felt he could have worked a little bit harder as well. Uh, He missed a couple of opportunities in the game, but strikers just have off days, don't they? Yeah, for sure. You know, strikers are so, um, sometimes it's it's a position where, 
you feel a bit lonely, you know, unless you play as a 4-4-2 where you've got someone up there with you that can help you out. When, when you're the only only striker there, it's a different job. Sometimes things don't really work out, you know, you just feel you're a bit on your own up there. You try to hold the ball, but don't get a lot of support. And 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 it's difficult sometimes. Sometimes, like you said, you've got off days where you don't feel sharp, you don't you're trying, but you can you can feel straight away that it's not just going to be a game for you where things are not going to really work out. But saying that, like you said, he's had he's had a couple of opportunities where were which were quite good opportunities, and and maybe if it be of lack of concentration, maybe because because he was not having a great game and and he was feeling a bit down because he was not touching a lot of the ball and ball were not coming up to him as as much as it normally. You know, has the ball so so a bit of lack of concentration when the ball comes in the in the final third, and that's where you've got to take the opportunity and take your chance. He didn't, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Andrew, did Saturday's game prove that at least in the big games that we cannot start with Aubameyang and Lacazette? Did was that the sort of concrete evidence that people have needed to see so they can stop going on about it? <laughs> Uh, again, I think it depends on the system you want to play, but if you're only going to play one striker, I think, yeah, it's it's one or the other at the moment, because I think if you have Alex Iwobi and Henrik Mkhitaryan, either side of a striker, it gives the team much better balance. You know, Aubameyang has played a lot from the left and scored quite a lot from the left, but he's not really a guy who who does a lot with the ball other than score, and I know he didn't score on, on Saturday, and that's something we'll come to, I, I guess, but uh, I think when you are playing just one striker, it is one or the other of Aubameyang and Lacazette. You know, if we had Danny Welbeck in in the team or in the squad, then he's another option to play in those in those wide positions, especially away from home. Uh, you know, against a team like Tottenham, who you know are going to press uh, and make life very difficult for you. I think it's important to keep the balance. And I think what was what was quite promising was how well the the team did defensively throughout that game. I know there are one or two moments. Um, but when you think about the season and where we've been really weak, it has been at the back. And I think what was really encouraging for me, uh, as much as it was frustrating not to win the game and we really should have taken all three points, it's been a, it's been a while since we're in even a position to win one of these big games away from home. So, uh, you know, I, I think people can get maybe a bit too hung up on the striker thing. Uh, they're two very, very good players. Both of them had days to forget on Saturday, but you know, it's not really, I don't think there's any need to delve into it so deeply when he chooses one over the other, because he just will think, well, maybe this game suits Aubameyang, this game suits Lacazette and that's it. And I think we should be happy enough that we've got two players that good to choose from. Absolutely. Totally agree with that. And I, I know we've already spoken briefly about Mustafi. Jeremy, in the week uh, when I'd done a preview show and a couple of radio shows that I'd been on, I actually called for Mustafi to play at right back. And it's exactly because of what Andrew said, not because he'll be a fantastic right back, but purely because we don't have any better options available at the moment. I thought he did really well. I thought the defence played a really narrow system, sort of like kind of like what Atletico Madrid try and do with a really narrow back four. And I thought that worked really well. But obviously the penalty came. Um, Harry Kane was offside, no doubt about that. But I've seen a lot of people getting on Mustafi's back and calling him clumsy and saying that it's his fault and this and that. Yes, he normally is like that. But on this case, I've got a lot of sympathy for him. Uh, I thought he played pretty well, don't you? Yeah, no, I think I think he played well, and I and I obviously completely agree with you guys in the fact of you know this, this it was a big game, North London derby playing away, and and probably like you said, we've we've got no one at right back at the moment, and uh, uh, Unai Emery for that an experienced player that hasn't got a forward minded as well because you've got you, you know you, you want somebody that's going to be there and and defend because for me. A defender is a defender first, you know, and and uh, and knowing that you had, you know, um, Spurs with Trippier and and Rose on the other side that likes to bomb on forward, you you want to have somebody that's going to be able to defend there, and that's probably why Mustafi was was the best option. Um, after you know, for the the penalty incident, obviously you just it's it's one of them things you know it's like small details that that make you win or lose games and unfortunately 
these days now with VAR and, and all sorts of things, the referee are so much under pressure by all them little fouls in the box on, on set piece and 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 they just got caught cool, unfortunately and, and you've just got to be so careful these days, you know, you just one or and then you, you just you just can't see the penalty, which you know, I agree that he had a good game, but obviously that little mistake, you know, cost us a penalty. So at the same time, you you kind of think that small details would have make you, you know, make us win the game. So he's, he's disappointed on that. But yeah, I think he, he played well. Absolutely. Andrew, you, your thoughts on that situation? Are you one of those that pins the blame solely on Mustafi? Because from my point of view, if the linesman does his job, we're not even discussing this. Uh, no, listen, absolutely. I think there's a, a a bigger discussion going on. I don't understand how anybody is making the case that Harry Kane wasn't offside, wasn't challenging for the ball, wasn't interfering or active. He clearly was. There were about four or five Tottenham players ahead of the ball when it came in. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's a terrible piece of officiating. At the same time, though, I, I think what Mustafi did was really, really stupid, basically. You know, he was right in front of the referee. There's no question in my mind that it was a foul, uh, leaving the, the the fact we didn't get the offside um, to, to one side. And it, it's just sort of the latest in a series of of incidents involving him where he just seems to either panic or, or loses his composure at key moments. You know, we, we've talked about him, you know, going to ground a bit too often as a central defender. He slides in uh, and gets done a bit too easily. And it happens quite consistently. There was a, a game earlier in the season. I can't quite remember which one it was, but it was away from home and he gave away a penalty again. It was sort of that, that moment where he sort of panicked in the box and made a foul where he didn't really need to make a foul. So, you know, I think he did okay as a right back. He's not really a right back. He was put in the team to do a specific job. And I think in general, he did it. He did it pretty well on the day. But that moment when you're right in front of the referee, you know, as Jeremy says, you've got to be really, really careful because uh, they're watching everything. It was uh, an obvious foul. And, and the thing about it is when you give... When you give Tottenham a penalty, you know that Harry Kane is going to take it. Harry Kane from the spot is is very, very um, clinical. You know, he's not going to miss those. There was never any doubt in my mind that he was going to do anything other than put the ball in the back of the net. So it is um, it is a shame, uh, you know, that, that we'd worked so hard as a team and that one moment really changed the, the momentum of the game because it didn't look like they were going to score. I didn't think they were going to score because, you know, the... the the two central defenders were were brilliant. Uh, Socrates and Koscielny were, were absolutely fantastic. Kane didn't really get any joy out of them at all for the entire game. And the only shot I think he had was the penalty, which tells you a lot about how well they played. So it is a shame just that that one particular moment of carelessness, if you want to call it that, being very diplomatic, um, had such a big impact on the game. Absolutely. Uh Jeremy, Andrew mentioned there that there are people making a case to say that Harry Kane was not interfering with play. And, you know, I've read countless articles in the aftermath of this game, you know, where people claiming that it wasn't um, offside. Some are saying it is. Some former referees have got differing opinions. Taking it away from Arsenal for a minute, this is a problem in football, isn't it? This rule needs to be clarified, would you not say? Oh, for sure, but this is a, this is an argument that, that that we will have for forever for me, and that's why when when the VAR came, and everybody's just for it, and and I've I've always says I, I'm I'm for it as long as it will be a, a, an obvious decision, which at the end it never is because we all judge a, 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 even a picture, even a replay, we're gonna have a different opinion. And and you know for me this is an obvious offside. Is no no way about it. Like, yeah. People that think this was not offside, I just can't believe how they, they they think that. You know, but it's the same with penalty. Sometimes you will see the replay, and and you and I will probably think differently. So it's just at the end of the day, it's another. You get a replay, but the referee at the end of the day is the one that makes the decision and. And you know, you just you just can go on and on about it. It'll, it'll always be a it'll always be a problem. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's it. That's exactly it, isn't it? I mean, we're we're we've watched 
I don't know how many replays uh, from how many angles there's been, you know, it's 48 hours after the game and there are still people who are arguing, no, he's, uh, he's on side because he's not uh, challenging for the ball. Anybody who I think who has, you know, half a brain is saying he's clearly offside. But the fact that despite all this evidence, there's still, there still isn't a consensus about what the decision is. And, you know, the thing about uh, VAR is we, we, I suppose have this idea that it's going to be, it's going to solve all the problems. Ultimately, it's just another guy watching a video and having to make a subjective decision. So it's not going to prove to be the thing that gets all the results or all the decisions right. I think it's just going to, I mean, I hope it will have a positive impact more than the negative. They'll, you would like to think they'll get more things right than they'll get wrong. But I still think there are going to be issues when VAR is introduced and we're going to sit here on this podcast or wherever and we're going to argue about how, how on earth did they make that decision when they have all those replays. So um, it's going to be very interesting to see how it all pans out, you know? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I'm a massive fan of VAR. I really want to see it work. I, I take both your points on board, though. There are lots of decisions where we're still going to be debating them. The, the only thing I'd say sort of back to you guys is that, yes, it's another person looking at it, but surely having that extra check increases the officials' chances of getting it right. doesn't mean they're going to get it right all the time, but it certainly increases that chance of of getting more things right, does it not? Um, listen, Harry, I understand exactly wh- where you're coming from, and I, and I agree with you on that point, but how would you feel if there's VAR on and the referee judged that it was a penalty when you, seeing the replay, think, but it's not a penalty, how, how can the referee give give it as a penalty you know it's like it's like Torreira's incident I've watched that replay that tackle and for me he had a red card but I'm sure referee will see and say oh yeah he's gone over the ball but he's gone over the ball because he tackled and kicked the ball away he could not have his feet on the floor there to kick the ball away yeah so he had to do you know what I mean and for me that would never been a red card but VAR and, and the referee might watch it and say oh no that's a definitely red card and and at the end of the day, as a, as a fan, people think of oh, VAR is just going to solve everything, which obviously it's not going to solve everything because it'll still be a, a personal opinion. It's, it'll be a, a, a referee or, uh, or the guy watching the replay that, that, that give his opinion and give the decision. And at the end of the day, as a fan, you'll just, people think, oh, yeah, VAR, that's it. Now, there won't be any more uh, bad decision made. It'll, it'll only be clear which is not clear, you know, there's still controversy and still argument about it. Yeah, that's all great points. I mean, Andrew, where do you stand on the Torreira red card? Um, Like with my Arsenal hat on, I think it's really a bit harsh, you know, I think it's, it's really harsh because, uh, you know, as Jeremy said, he did get the ball first and his momentum carried him into Rose who was moving towards him, you know? So I think it was, it was quite accidental. Um, so I think I, I do think it was a, a bit harsh. You know, I think it's difficult when you see a player uh, connect with another player high up on the shin. It does look bad. There's no question about that. You know, as Arsenal fans, we've seen some players suffer injuries down the years and, and maybe the, the tackles on them weren't punished as much as they should have been. Um, I think what frustrates me a bit about the, about the Torreira red card is the fact that Danny Rose didn't get a red card for his challenge on, on burned Leno. Uh, I know Leno was down on his hunkers and, <laughs> and uh, Rose was going for the ball, but think about, think about where that would have connected with Leno. If he hadn't been down to try and make a save, it would have been where at his knee or on his shin in almost exactly, exactly the same place. So I, I don't understand how if Torreira is a red card, Rose isn't. I mean, he puts his studs into the goalkeeper's chest and he's over the top of the ball. You hear them talk all the time about that. If a player goes over the top of the ball with his stud showing, it's a red card. That should be a red mm. card all day long. And I feel sorry for Torreira, you know, in the context of the game and, and the moment at which it happened, you know, in the last 60 seconds, I think the referee could have shown a bit more common sense, particularly as he let Danny Rose away with with his challenge on Leno. 
Yeah, I think that's that's kind of where I stand on it as well. I can kind of see why when the referee's seen him go over the top of the ball, like you said, he's deemed that to be dangerous play and endangering the opponent. I completely get that. But like you, my frustration comes from the fact that Danny Rose has done the same thing and gotten away with it. And it's all about consistency for me with referees. Each referee is going to have a different view of things. And But if a referee within a 90-minute period can at least be consistent, then I'm okay with that. But we're not seeing that and it's kind of frustrating and, you know, it's something that's been going on for a really, really long time now. Um, how did you guys think that Matteo Guendouzi got on? I know he was taken off at half time. Uh, Jeremy, what was your view on it? Because I was actually surprised to see him start because I've always felt that Torreira and Xhaka is the most balanced pair that we have in there. And I was surprised to see Guendouzi start, but he did well, didn't he? Yeah, he did well. I was just, uh, yeah, a bit surprised to see him coming off uh, so early. But um, yeah, like you, I think I think he's, you know, he's only he's only nineteen. He was playing in second division last year in France. Um, he's adapted to the Premier League and, and to life in England, so, you know, so quickly. And I think he's been playing so many games lately, and and that's why I was a bit surprised seeing him start in in, in such a big game when I feel lately he's been. You know, he's still been good technically, but I think physically he's, he's just, you know, it's a lot of game, you know, every two, three days playing. And, and I, you know, I'm surprised not seeing Torreira playing uh, as much lately. He's, he's Genduzi all the time and, and Xhaka and Torreira's quite often on the bench. And, I, yeah, I was a bit surprised. And, and that's maybe why Unai Emery just took him off so so quick and just for listen, he's, he's doing all right, but let's just kind of share the game with with Torreira. Yeah, I mean, Andrew, it's a, it's a bit of a risk to take, though, isn't it? Changing the heart of your midfield it, it, at half time in such a huge game. Yeah, it can be. I don't think he took him off because he was playing badly, though. You know, um, he, he, he was doing fine, I think. Uh, you know, we weren't maybe as in control of midfield as we normally are. But I don't think that was the game plan. You know, I don't think it was really in Unai Emery's mind that we were going to go to Wembley and, and uh, control lots of possession in midfield, particularly as he chose, you know, the two and he had Aaron Ramsey a little bit ahead. So I think maybe it was a bit about sharing the game and keeping one player fresh, you know, get a good 45 minutes out of Gendouzi, get a good 45 minutes out of Torreira with both players knowing exactly what they're supposed to be doing in there. I think Torreira was good when he came on. I think uh, Gendouzi was fine uh, in the first half. I don't know, you know, what we could have done, which would have made, you know, a huge difference to the to the dynamic of the game. But you know, when you look at how well we were organised across the pitch yesterday or on Saturday, rather, you know, all of the players played a really good part in that. You know, there were some really good standout performances. I thought Mkhitaryan, for example, was was excellent. Um, Alex Iwobi did well on the left. Uh, you know, all the players put in a real shift and they made Tottenham look fairly, fairly toothless. You know, they didn't have a great deal of opportunities uh, to score a goal. I know Bernd Leno made that amazing double save, which was probably Tottenham's best moment, but that was one moment over 90 minutes. So I think the way that Emery set his team up was designed to to nullify Tottenham and their attacking threat. Uh, and he did it very well. So, you know, the way that he deployed his players and, and used his squad to do that, you know, I think the substitutions were quite good as well. You know, the way that he brought on, uh, you know, Ozil a bit later on. And who was the other substitute that came on? Um, uh, it's gone out of my head right now. Obama Young. It, that's it. Obama, Obama, Obama Young. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so Obama Young for, for Lacazette and, and Ozil, you know, we weren't weakened at any point by making changes. So I thought that was really encouraging. That was one of the encouraging parts of, of yesterday's performance. Tottenham at home, you know, would like to, you think about the Manchester United game uh, a few weeks back when David De Gea made, I don't know how many saves, a hundred saves, you know, because Tottenham were so threatening and they didn't threaten at all, really. So I think that's to the, to the credit of the manager and the way that he used the squad. Definitely, definitely, completely agree. Um, I want to talk about Socrates. Now, uh, being Greek, I'm going to brag about this guy's performance because he was fantastic <laughs> at the weekend. I, I've got to, I'm sorry. Um, but Jeremy, you must have come across some centre-halves in your time of, of Socrates' ilk. 
How difficult is it to to get the better of someone so physical and so streetwise? It's it, it's very very hard because you know what you you probably think oh, I'm faster than we that than him I'm quicker than him I'm just gonna you know but this guy is just a beast man he's like he's not <laughs> giving you any space he's on your toes you can see the guy lives to defend that's all he does and and you haven't got many like people that enjoy defending like he does you know I've I've, I've only seen a few in my career that I've played against and I thought oh my god this guy's just on me all the time, don't give you any space, any 50-50 challenge, he goes 100%. He's like, you, you can see his reaction when he wins a tackle or when he, you know, when he makes a, a good challenge that he, he's just enjoy it. He loves it, you know, and that's that's why he's, he's so good at it. Yeah, he, he was fantastic. Absolutely brilliant. And Andrew, it's worth giving Lauren Koscielny some praise as well, isn't it? Because a lot of people have spoken about the fact that he might be finished now and he might be on his way down. And I kind of agree with that overall, but I think he was brilliant at the weekend. And those two together could be the key to us achieving our goals this season. Do you agree? Well, I mean, they look like the best partnership that we have available to us. You know, they they work well together. I think uh, the... As as Jeremy said, Socrates is a bit of a beast. You know, he he loves defending, and I love seeing a defender who just wants to prevent the opposition scoring at any cost. He reminds me a little bit in terms of his attitude and the way he likes to play the game. He reminds me a little bit of of Martin Keown, who I'm sure Jeremy got a few kicks yeah. off in training over the years. <laughs> you oh, know, go, this... go <laughs> <laughs> sorry to bring up bad memories for you, um, <laughs> but you know, there's, there's just something about the way that he plays the game. You know, it's, it's very committed and Koscielny's a really clever defender. You know, he's still quick. He reads the game very well. Uh, you know, he 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 positions himself. I think one of the things I've been really impressed by since he came back from the injury, and the injury I'm sure has had a little bit of a physical effect on him because when you're 32 years of age and you, you rupture your Achilles, it's a very serious and traumatic injury. And I think it will have a, a physical effect on you. But what I've noticed with him is that he, he has – his positioning and the way that he reads the game now, uh, it reminds me a little bit of, of Per Mertesacker, um, the way that he used to position himself. So when the ball came in or when the cross comes in, he's generally in the right area to make a clearance. And I think when you consider just how demanding it is to come back from an injury like that at, at his age, to be playing at the level he's playing at and to be playing as well as he's playing is, is absolutely fantastic. He deserves huge credit. And I really, really hope that between now and May, Socrates and Koscielny can stay fit and play the majority of our games and especially, especially the big games, because I think if they do, we've got a better chance of, of keeping clean sheets. And I think with the, the firepower we have in the squad and in the team, uh, therefore we've got a better chance of winning games. So I, I think the two of them deserve big, big credit for what they did on Saturday. And, and let's not re uh, forget, you know, a few weeks ago, they were brilliant against Chelsea at home as well. You know, when we beat Chelsea, uh, a lot That's of right, that was yeah. down to that central defensive partnership. So if they can stay fit, then I think we, we could be on a, on a, a good road between now and May. Yep. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Now coming towards the end of the game. Now, as we sort of delve into it, the crucial penalty at the end that Pierre Mirko Bamiang unfortunately missed uh, Jeremy. First of all, I want to ask both of you, actually, before we sort of get into the ins and outs of it. Did you think it was a penalty? Uh, I didn't. But because I was so wound up about the Harry Kane one, I wasn't going to admit that at the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, personally, when I, when I saw it first, I thought, yeah, penalty, because the defender were behind him. Uh, but when you see the replay, I, I, I don't think it's a penalty. Uh, but, <coughs> but you see that the problem again is, is with the, the way defenders sometimes move their legs a little bit. The, the, the referee, from from the angle that he was, he probably thought, oh, yeah, he touched him and he got he put him, you know, got him down. Um, but after watching the replay, you see Sanchez obviously moving his his foot, but not touching Obama Young. It's just kind of the rhythm that he was on that made him fall. But um, no, personally, I didn't think it was a penalty. But like you said, you know, after after the the penalty that we. Uh, that we concede, uh, I was uh, I was really happy. Uh, 
from the referee's decision, <laughs> really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, sh- I share that view. Andrew, your, your thoughts on that decision? I think it was soft, but I'm never going to turn down a penalty against <laughs> Tottenham in the last minute of a derby. It was a bit soft. It was a bit soft, but like, you know, uh, considering what came before, you know, you're not going to turn around and say, no, thanks. So, uh, you know, I, I think the bigger issue is what happened <laughs> when when he stepped up to take it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, what about this, this encroachment thing? Because now we always see encroachment when penalties are taken, but not to that extent. I mean, Jan Vertonghen was practically in line with Aubameyang when he struck the ball. I mean, Jeremy, that's just not acceptable, is it? Considering he was the one to hook it off the line as well. But that's what I mean. That's that's a massive, you know, it might be a small details on on the, on another penalty that Aubameyang would have scored, or but on that particular penalty, it's just massive because he gets back in time to save it, you know, f- for the for the rebound kind of when when uh, Aubameyang get the chance to tap it in. Obviously, he's back there because he was he was halfway, you know, obviously halfway there already. So it's uh, you know, and that's what I mean. Obviously, on that incident, maybe VAR would have would have been able to get seen, and obviously would have been retaken. I, I don't know, but what I don't get is how many you know you've got the 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 penalty taker, you've got the referee there, and you've got the linesman for the that is on the line. Yeah, the the referee's got basically nothing else to do apart blowing the whistle and looking at you know who's coming in the box. That's all he's got to do. So how did he not see him? Being like pretty much with Aubameyang on the same line when he when he took the penalty, I just don't understand. Yeah, Andrew, your thoughts on that? I feel like the referee has seen it and he's bottled it away at Spurs. I don't think he wants to dare mm. blow the whistle and pull it back after Loris has saved it. Yeah, I mean, I get that. I absolutely get that, and I understand it. But my primary thought is that he should have scored the penalty in the first place, and we wouldn't be talking about it. You know. Um, I, I know strikers can miss penalties and anyone can miss a penalty. I, I just didn't feel like he looked confident when he stepped up to take it. And I just think it was, uh, I think he made it easy for, for Loris. Um, subsequently, you can complain about the, the encroachment, but I think, you know, in that situation, you know, a player of his quality and his caliber and his experience, I think he should take a better penalty and we wouldn't be talking about encroachment. Yeah, yeah, you're you're ultimately right. I've got to say, um, right, <laughs> bringing us sort of towards the end of the conversation, guys. So I know conscious of time and everything, but where does that leave us now? Uh, starting with yourself, Andrew, where does that result leave us in terms of our Champions League hopes? What are you expecting from the United game? What do you think we need to get out of that match? I think we probably need to beat Manchester United. It feels like a, a real six pointer that game, you know, because they're ahead of us at, at this moment in time. Uh, we are at home. I, I feel despite how disappointing and frustrating it was to, to I was going to say to lose that game because it still feels like we lost it a bit <laughs> it <does>. um, <laughs> when we did. Uh, I, I think there was a lot to be encouraged about from the way we played you know, simply the fact that we should have won the game and it was in our hands to win the game. Um, ultimately, we didn't, of course, but I think there was a lot to be encouraged about, you know. I, and, I, and what I really hope is that we get a, a response from some of the players who didn't necessarily play that well. And I think, you know, across the board, the vast majority of, of the team played really well. Where we were perhaps let down a bit were the two strikers on the day. Lacazette missed a couple of good chances. Aubameyang... I think if we go back from the penalty was put through by an amazing pass from Mkhitaryan and I, I would expect him to do better in that circumstance because it's the kind of service that he thrives on, you know, a ball in behind and with his pace, I, I thought he would do better there. So, you know, maybe their pride will be a little bit wounded and maybe Jeremy can, can expand on this a little bit, but when you've had a bad game and you know, you haven't necessarily contributed as much as you, you should have, you probably want to redouble your efforts for the next game. And, you know, if we can get a reaction out of the two strikers ahead of Manchester United and the rest of the team can play as well as we did against Spurs, then I think we've got a good chance of winning that game at home. Brilliant. Jeremy, your your thoughts, where does that leave us? What are you expecting from the United game? Is a win crucial? 
Yeah, for sure. I, I totally agree with Andrew there. You know, that that, that was a massive game. And unfortunately, we, you know, we lost two points there, you know. And, and when you think about, obviously, now Man U, a point uh, in above us, and, and you think that Chelsea is just a point behind with a game in hand as well. So, you know, if they win that game, we'll be sixth, really. So, you know, playing Man U is kind of... Uh, it's kind of a bit of a of a like godsend, really, because you're playing them at home. I know they're in great form, but so are we. I think we're playing really well at the moment, and and that's the game that obviously the boys can't sleep up there. They've all got to turn up, all got to be hundred percent, and 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 this time, you know, them little details that make you win the games. You've just got to be be focused, concentrate, and don't make them mistake. And obviously, I'm talking about Mustafi's penalty. Obama Young's penalty as well, you know, like 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 Andrew say, you know, a player like like Obama Young should should just call that, or at least, or at least pull it somewhere where you've got more percentage of chance of scoring. Which the way the way I see it is a striker that pull it in them position, it's a 50-50. because if the keeper chooses the right the right direction, then then he, he saves it, he saves it easy. If you if you put it higher up, or with obviously more power higher up, even if the goalkeeper chooses the right direct like the right um, side, you know it's, it's still more than a 50-50 for him to save. He's still got job to do. So yeah. it, it was it was a poor penalty, uh, but yeah, no, the, listen, Man U game's massive. I I think as well was gonna. What's going to come into it is obviously the Europa League as well that we, you know, we play in Ren away on on Thursday night, and and that's probably as well another thing why Lacazette started that game because he's suspended yeah. against Good against point. Ren, and that and that's maybe why Unai Emery, you know, at the end of the day, I know managers always says, oh no, I'm just focused on on the next game, you know, each game at the time, but to prepare your squad, and now the the crucial time where we are in the season. You know, he's he's thinking ahead. You've got to, you know, you've got to rest the player at a certain time and make sure they're fresh. He sees them, he sees them every day at training, so he knows. Um, you know, and that's why probably, like I said, you know, like I said, was uh, started and Aubameyang didn't because Aubameyang will be will be starting on Thursday evening as a striker and and he's got to rotate and try to keep everybody concerned and fresh as much as he can. Absolutely. Jeremy, just quickly, a Renner threat to Arsenal? Do you have any insight? You know, uh, you know what? Ren's this season has been very consistent. Um, you know, my uh, the coach was Sabri Lamushi, which is a good friend of mine, and he got he got sacked um, not long ago because, yeah, he was, he was not having a great season. They expected uh, much more from him. Uh, but Ren are a team which in, uh, incredible individual players, as as you probably remember Ben Arfa when he was yep. you know playing for Marseille, Lyon, and, and even Newcastle before he got uh, he got badly injured. But he's he's one of of them player on his day. He just can can just run everybody you know crazy on the pitch individually. He's, he's incredible. So uh, if they turn up and they're all in a good day, they, they've got very good very good players, and and you won't be easy for us now. I'm sure uh, Ben Arthur will be looking to stick it to Unai Emery as well. Uh, for yeah. sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, just quickly, guys. Uh, can I have a prediction for the Manchester United game from each of you? Just quickly. Uh, starting with Andrew. I think... Okay. I'm going to go for 3-1 to Arsenal. I like. I love the positivity, Andrew. Jeremy? I was I was gonna say three two me because I know the way my new players at the moment is very <laughs> open game and and they will I think they will score because they've got incredible talent up front uh, but they're they're open at the back as well so and I think we'll you know with the player that we've got at the moment who are you know on form like it will be Mickey Tyen and and hopefully Lacazette or Aubameyang will be a uh, will be on form and and, and wanted to you know, kind of forget that Spurs game. Um, yeah, I think it'll be a very open game with quite a few goals. 
fingers crossed you're both right and we and we win the game at least that's all that matters um guys yeah. i cannot thank you enough for taking the time to come on the show this evening um it's a real pleasure to have you both on jeremy you you, you know you're a former arsenal player a hero of mine so always a pleasure to talk to you and andrew you're the inspiration behind me even starting podcasting so i i can't tell you how grateful i am for having you both on and, and thanks once again well, no thank problem you thanks much. yeah thanks a lot Wow, what a great couple of guests. Uh, Lots of North London Derby chat there for you guys to dig your teeth into. I'd like to hear what you guys think about some of the points raised on this week's show. You can tweet me at chronicles underscore AFC, or you can email me if you prefer that, chroniclesafc at gmail.com. Now, it's come to that point in the show where I'm going to answer some of you guys' questions. Uh, Let's have a look, and he says as he scrolls through Twitter, to find the post. Here we go. Uh, right, so first question comes in from Benjamin Dunn. Have we been messing about with Mustafi at centre-back where he can be exposed rather than allowing him to be effective at right-back where he can only really be exposed on one side? He was almost effective there against Spurs. Um, I, I think it's a little harsh to to lay into Skodran Mustafi's performance at the weekend because I think that he was extremely unfortunate. As I said already in the show, if the linesman does his job, then Skodran Mustafi's foul if well it's not even really a foul is it because the play should have been stopped but Scott Ram Mustafi's action is not something we're discussing so um I think he did do a good job at right back I called it earlier on in the week in the preview show that I felt he could do a job there and I thought that Unai's selection was justified I think he's been let down by the officials so I'm not going to lay in too hard on Shkodran Mustafi yes he's got previous yes he's let us down in the past but I didn't think he let us down at the weekend um, this next question comes from uh, let's have a look Okay, here we are. This one comes from Jedi Guna uh, on Twitter. He says, doesn't it seem clear that Ramsey leaving has little to do with him fitting in the Emery system, but really it's all about the money he was demanding based on what Juventus were going to pay him? Hmm. I think it could be financial. Um, I think as a footballer, you're going to be inclined to go where the money is. I think most people are like that in their jobs. So I can't really fault him for doing that. I think that Aaron Ramsey probably would have stayed at Arsenal if a sensible offer was on the table and it wasn't withdrawn, uh, which we're led to believe. I think that's had a huge impact um, on his sort of mentality. I think once that happened, he was never going to stay. Uh, and you know what? Fair play to him. He's, he's scored some really important goals for this club. Uh, and imagine that ended up being the winner at the weekend, how we'd be talking about Aaron Ramsey today. So I, I think I kind of give Aaron Ramsey a pass on this because in my opinion, he's been extremely professional uh, despite the fact that he's leaving in the win- in the summer. Sorry. So yeah. Um, I don't think it was all about money with Aaron Ramsey. I think it became about money when it was evident that the club weren't going to pay him his market value. I think that's a safe way of saying it. Now, the next question comes from Eric Colton on Twitter. Uh, He says, are Spurs a symptom of today's culture? You don't have to be successful. You just need to come across as successful. I think... Yeah, you're spot on. I think it's kind of a shift in in the culture. I think you're absolutely right in saying that. I think that uh, nowadays finishing in the top four is probably more valuable than winning one of the domestic cups. Maybe not in the fans' eyes, but certainly in the club's eyes, uh, given that the f- the financial reward of doing that. So uh, yeah, I guess they are a symptom of today's culture. That's a really good question as well. Uh, thank you once again for that, Mr. Eric Colton. And that brings us to the end of another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna, sponsored by Loserpool. My thanks to my two guests this week, Jeremy Aliadier and Andrew from Arsblog. I uh, can't thank the guys enough, and I hope you guys enjoyed listening to them. I'm sure you did. Uh, again, massive shout out to our sponsors, Loserpool. Head over to loserpool.com for more information. It's a fantastic game, um, a real chance for you there to win some fantastic cash prizes. So please. Please, please do check that out. Uh, I want to point to your attention the fact that on YouTube, and we are an audio podcast, so I appreciate that most of you don't listen on YouTube, but over there we are 
just shy of a thousand subscribers. We're over the 900 mark now and I'd really like to get us up to 1,000 on YouTube by the end of the current season. So I'd appreciate your support. If you could just take the time to head over to YouTube, type in the Chronicles of Aguna and hit that subscribe button. Of course, we need you to leave us a review on iTunes. That's very important in pushing us up the rankings. So if you could head over to iTunes, if that's where you listen from, uh, and please make sure you do that too. Uh, and lastly, I just want to say a massive thank you to my colleagues over at the same old Arsenal podcast, in particular Craig, uh, who organised a fantastic event in association with fans, but where I got to present a section uh, of the Q&A night with Nigel Winterburn and Kevin Campbell. So a massive thanks to Craig for that. And uh, we'll be back on Friday this week with our preview show. So until then, take care. <laughs>